guys, well today we're going to look at the grade 12 electrodynamics section of motors, which builds on the foundation of our grade 11 electromagnetism. Let's have a look at what we're going to do today. So first of all, just want to have a look at well, where do we find motors? How are they used in our day-to-day -day life? Then we're going to do a review of our grade 11 foundation, Fleming's left-hand motor rule. We need to then get into the details of what actually makes a motor work, the electrodynamics behind the mechanics of it. Then the key ingredient in those mechanics is the split ring commutator. Brilliant little device. And the last thing is once we've got a motor, how do we improve it? How do we make it stronger? So that's an overview of where we're going. Let's get into it. Where do we use motors? Where might you find a motor in your day-to-day -day life? They are all over the place. For example, if you go to a tall building and you jump in the elevator, the lift taking you to the top of the building, that is controlled by an electric motor. What about aircon units? In the hot weather that you might be experiencing towards your exams, an aircon unit would be so cool right now. Uh, aircon units use electricity to turn the fan, compress the air, etc. What about electric cars and buses and things like that? Well, these are becoming more and more important in this day and age of re reducing our carbon emissions. All of those things run on electric motors and you'll find them in your home, all over the place, in your hairdryer, uh, the blender, the little microwave turntable that goes around and even your electric toothbrush. So they have one thing in common and that is that they will turn electrical energy into mechanical energy. That is what a motor does. Just as a matter of interest, you might wonder what is the difference between a motor and an engine? Okay, well a motor as we said, turns electrical energy into mechanical energy, whereas an engine, like your normal petrol or diesel car, uses a fuel, which is chemical energy, into mechanical energy. So engines use chemical energy, motors use electrical energy. Okay, now, physics. How does this thing work? Well, you may remember from last year, Fleming's left-hand rule, that funny thing that you get your arm contorted into weird positions. Uh, you have your three fingers pointed at 90 degrees to each other, X, Y, and Z. And um, let's have a look at how it works. So we've got our magnet with its field going from north to south. Then we're going to place a wire carrying a current within that magnetic field. Now remember that a wire, or a current carrying conductor, as it's sometimes called, has its own magnetic field. So now these two fields are going to interfere. And in fact, the way we've drawn it is incorrect. We can't have the lines intersecting with each other like that. They will actually blend with each other to form a new field. Let's just have a go back a bit. Let's have a look and see how this works. Just a reminder. You see at the bottom there, they, both the fields are actually going in the same direction. So they will reinforce each other to cause an extra strong magnetic field down the bottom. Whereas at the top, they're actually going in opposite directions and so they'll cancel out. So that is how you get this structure of the combined field at the bottom um, and then the cancelled out field up at the top. So what does this do to the wire? This is where Fleming's left hand rule comes in. So just a reminder of what's what with the rule. Your thumb stands for the force acting on the wire. Your first finger is the field, the external magnetic field. And your second finger is the current in the current carrying conductor. F for force, B for field, I for current, FBI. Nice easy way to remember that. Okay, so um, in this case, my, my hand is, is arranged just how we need it actually. So the field is going to the right from your perspective. The current is coming towards you out of the screen, which is why we put a dot there. And therefore the force will be upwards. Okay, so that's something to practice. You can do it with your friend, you can do it from past paper questions, but get to know how to do this because they're bound to ask a question, which way will the motor spin? Or which side is positive of the battery or something along those lines. So that's the basis of um, the physics or the science behind a motor, is we, we're using a magnetic field with a current going through it to get motion. But it's not particularly useful motion now because it's just going up, okay? To get a motor, we need it to spin. So let's look at the structure of a motor. To get our heads into this, we're gonna look at it from the top view, looking down on the motor, and we're gonna look at it from a side view, looking at a cross section of the motor. And the first ingredient we need is a coil. 
Now a coil is a very nifty start because I'll get the current flowing there. You can see the current's going up the one side and then it comes back down the other side. So it goes one way and then it goes the other way. If we look at it from the side view, so where our eye is effectively down here at the bottom, we're looking into the motor like this. And on the one side, on the left hand side, we've got the current going away from us but on the right hand side it's coming towards us. By the way, the dot and the cross, do you remember the whole thing of if there was a dart coming towards you um, or an arrow coming towards you, uh, or I'd jump out the way if I were you, uh, but what you would actually see is the point of the dart if it was coming towards you, hence the dot, that's the one on the right hand side. If it was going away from you, you'd see the flights or the feathers at the back and that's why they have a cross. That's the structure initially. Uh, what's the impact of that? Remember that the fields around those two wires are actually going in the opposite direction. One's going clockwise, one's going anti-clockwise. Therefore, they're going to interfere with the field in the opposite direction as well. So using our Fleming's left-hand rule, look, look at the one on the right-hand side. That's like the one we saw before. Field's going to the right, current is coming out of the screen, therefore the force on it will be upwards. Okay, And the field on the other side is still going to the right, current is now going into the screen, therefore the force on it will be downwards. Okay, so that is exactly what we want because now we've got one side being pushed up and we've got the other side being pulled down and that creates our rotational ax um, action which is the basis of a motor. Let's get into this a little bit more. So we get our motor spinning, the forces in the opposite direction, spins a little bit, current is still in the same direction, forces are still in the same direction, spins a little bit more. Now, when that X gets down to the bottom there, current is going away from us. If it doesn't change, the force is still going to be down. Hmm, a little bit of a problem. Because if it does go past, let's say it has a little bit of momentum and it goes past that point at the bottom. If the force doesn't change, then it's actually just going to get pulled back down to the bottom. Oh, that's not a particularly useful motor. It sort of just does a half turn and then doo -doo -doo -doo, it's just going to stop there. So we're not going to be blending any milkshakes or brushing our teeth with anything like that. What we need to do when it gets to that halfway point is to flip the current. Nifty idea. So the thing that was getting pulled down to the bottom now can get pulled back up to the top. Like imagine when you're riding a bicycle, okay? You're riding a bicycle and with your right foot you push down on the pedal. Now when your foot gets to the bottom you don't keep pushing down, you then allow it to get pulled back up to the top again and then you push down and then you pull up and then you push down. It's got to change every 180 degrees and that's exactly what we've got to do with, with our motor. So when we flip the current, as you can see there, dots and crosses have gone the other way around, then the forces will change and so therefore it's going to get pulled back up to the top from the bottom and pulled back down to the bottom from the top. Okay, so let's, let's let this thing roll and, and have a look at the way that the, the current flips every half turn. Okay, so it gets to the top and then it flips and then it comes down and it gets to the bottom and then it flips and so on. And that is how we get our motor to actually spin. Now all very well to say well that's great in theory but how do you do this in practice? And this is where that awesome secret ingredient comes in, uh, the very nifty little invention of the split ring commutator. Okay, so let's dig into this magic part of the motor. Well, it's not that magic. It's just a great idea. Remember, if we connected it directly to the battery, it's only going to do a quarter turn or a half turn and then it's going to stop. So that's no good. We're going to remove the battery, but we're going to use those two connections and we're going to put on either one a half ring. So it's split in the middle. There's a half ring on the one and a half ring on the other. That's called our split ring. The split ring is then connected to the rest of the circuit by these carbon brushes that sort of slide around the outside of the ring as it goes past. And it's used, we use carbon because it, it, it's, um, graphite is, is very smooth and um, it's a good conductor of electricity. So the split ring and the carbon brushes make up our split ring commutator. Let's have a look at how this works from a cross-sectional point of view. There's our battery. Now we're going to get the current to flow just now. Remember the current's going to go from positive to negative. So it's going to first be going um, sort of away from us in the dark grey side and towards us in the light grey side. Then as it starts to spin, it's going to get to the other side and of course it's going to flip to the other way. Let's have a look. So there goes the current. 
See, dark gray side now goes to the other side and it's coming towards us. Then it comes back to the original side and the current is going away from us. And then it goes around, it's still connected to the brush. Now it connects to the other brush and it's going towards us. So that is how the split string commutator does this clever idea of switching the current every half turn. In fact, you can use that as an answer. The split ring commutator reverses the current in the coil every half rotation. That is its job. Let's have a look in a little bit more detail at exactly the same thing, just so that we can get our heads fully around it. Here's a little video showing an animation, a 3D animation of the same setup. You can see the current flowing through the external circuit to the brush, the brush connecting with the commutator, with the split ring. Then each half turn, the split ring goes across to the other side and the current reverses, enabling our coil to keep spinning. Let's have a look at this one more time. Okay, so watch carefully. So you can see that the current in the external circuit is consistent, always going from positive to negative. But as the coil spins, each time the split ring reaches the other side, it flips. So it gets pulled up to the top, the current going away from us. When it gets to the top, current comes towards us and it gets pulled down to the bottom. When it gets to the bottom, the current flips again and it goes back up to the top, etc. Nifty, isn't it? Okay, so we've got a motor. Now we want to have the most effective and powerful motor that we can. So if we want to strengthen a motor, well, the first thing you can do is add more coils. Or we sometimes say you add more turns to the coil. But basically, every time you wrap another wire around, it will add strength to your motor. Second thing we can do is increase the magnetic field strength. Stronger magnets. Stronger magnets are going to create a bigger force. Bigger force, obviously, a stronger motor. Then the current that's flowing through our coil, the stronger that is, in other words, a larger voltage causing a greater current, that is going to cause the motor to go faster or to be stronger. And the last thing we can do is to utilize a soft iron core inside the coil. And the soft iron core has the impact of increasing uh, the magnetic flux density, or in other words, making it a stronger field within that coil. So increase the number of coils, stronger magnetic field, increase the current, or use a soft iron core. And those are how we strengthen a motor. So quick overview of what we covered today. The electrodynamics of a motor, we needed to have something to be able to spin. Hence, we had a coil, one side going, experiencing an upward force, one side experiencing a downwards force. Then we looked at the key ingredient of the mechanism, which is the split ring commutator, whose job is to reverse the current in the coil every half rotation. And lastly, we considered how to strengthen a motor by having more coils, having a stronger magnetic field, increasing the current in the coil, or using an iron core. Okay, so that's a quick review of, of motors. There are a few other little details that I'm sure your teacher will be able to talk you through. And the key thing is remember to practice as many questions as you can, because that'll help you to see how the examiners might test your knowledge on this from all sorts of different directions. So good luck with that. Cheers.